So today we're talking about credit risk, which is the most important risk type for most traditional banks, I would say, right? And as I've told you in, in the video about Basel III, most banks need to use two approaches to calculate their risk. And those approaches are called pillar one and pillar two, which is just uh, how it's called in the regulation Basel III. And today we're going to cover both approaches, pillar one and pillar two, and you will see why both approaches exist. So the pillar one approach is a very simple approach. And the pillar one approach basically says we need to calculate our risks and they are called risk weighted assets. And those um, and this risk number is simply the exposure, which is just a banking term for um, the volume of the credit times a risk weight, right? RW. And here you see the so-called IRB formula for the risk weight. I don't want to go into what IRB is. If you're really interested, Google it or I will make a future video about this. But I wanted to, to show you which numbers actually go into this risk weight, right? And the first number you see is the so-called LGD. LGD is short for loss given default. And this number gives you information on how secure the loan is. You can imagine that you have given a loan to a company which is 100 million euros and this company gives you the company headquarters as a security and those company headquarters are worth 80 million euros. In this case, your loss given default would be 0.8 or 80% because if the company can't pay back the loan of 100 million euros, you get the headquarters of 80 million euros, right? So you will lose 20% of your credit, but 80% can be recovered via the credit, uh, via the security. What you also see going into the formula is the so-called PD. It's at different points of the formula. And PD just means probability of default. And probability of default is just a measure of how probable is it that the counterparty can pay back the loan in the next year. And what you also see go in there is the so-called maturity. And maturity is just um, how long the loan actually goes, whether it's one year or two years or three years. And now you see how you obtain your risk-weighted assets for credit risk. It's really simple. You calculate the risk-weighted assets for every single credit and you just add those risk-weighted assets, right? You take every credit exposure, you calculate the risk weight, you multiply them, and then you add all those credits. And this is how you get your risk-weighted assets for pillar under the pillar one approach. The pillar two approach works a bit differently. And for this, we need a bit of statistics. What you see here is a so-called probability density function, right? If you don't know what that is, there are a lot of great videos on YouTube explaining a probability density function. And what this function shows is the, the, the probability for the loss of your entire credit portfolio, right? And within this certain credit portfolio, you see that a loss of 20 million within the next year is rather probable. And you also see that a loss of 100 million is rather improbable. Yeah. And what you do within the pillar two approach, you try to understand what is the loss in a 99.9% .9 worst case. Yeah. So you try to calculate this probability density function and then you take the integral to obtain the 99.9% worst case, worst case. So in other words, the area under this graph should be 99.9% and here the area, the worst case area should be 0.01%. Right? You take the integral in order to obtain the worst case. Yeah. So the question really is, how do I obtain this probability density function? Because taking the integral is really easy. This is what every computer can do. But the question is, how do I actually obtain this probability density function? Because this is what the result ultimately depends on, right? And I don't want to go into too much detail, but basically you obtain this function by modeling the credit portfolio and taking into account the exposure amount, the PDs, the LGDs, and and this is the special thing about the pillar two approach, you take into account the correlations. And you take into account the correlations between creditors and between creditor and security. And this is really important. Right? Because most of the times you have a rather diversified portfolio, meaning you have invested into train companies and 
maybe airplane companies, right? And if train companies have a bad year, airplane companies probably will have a good year, right? Meaning that you can't just add the loss figures or the loss probabilities because if one company has a good year, the other company in your portfolio will have a bad year. So the correlations will decrease your risk. Right? And another point with the creditor and the security, right? most of the times the correlation between the creditor and the security is not one, right? meaning if the creditor has a default, the security might not default. Right? Think back about the example of the company. Maybe let's say it's a train company and you have given this train company a loan of 100 million euros and this train company has given you its headquarters as a security. If the train company defaults, the real estate market may be really great at the time and your security may be worth just as much as in the beginning. And the last component that typically goes into this model is a component of randomness. You basically say, I don't really know how my credit portfolio is going to perform in the next year. And how this mathematically works is you take your credit portfolio and you simulate it. Right? And depending on how the randomness is chosen, you might obtain a path like the the path on top or a path like the path on the bottom right and what you will do is you will simulate this many many times and you will take the 99.9 percent .9 worst case right in this case it is this case this is it is this line this is the worst case line it's the line with the highest loss right and you take this line and this line is your measurement for your loss under pillar two and it's it is also called economic capital and you see that this economic capital is not just a sum of the individual credits, but it's, uh, it's um, calculated over the entire portfolio, taking into account the different correlations between the different credits and securities. Yeah. And you see what the, um, what the uh, advantages or disadvantages are of both approaches, right? Pillar one is very easy to implement. You just need the formula from the regulator and then you're good to go, right? You don't need no mathematicians to, to model. You, you don't need anyone to implement complicated computer models. This is very easy and it's very comparable because every bank basically uses the same formula. The pillar two approach is complicated, right? And you need to, there's a lot of modeling uncertainty However, it, it is more accurate or might be more accurate as it takes into account the correlations between different creditors and also the creditor and the security. Right? But it's not as easily comparable between different financial institutions.